I'm going to start over again. Hi, good evening and welcome to Monday Night Politics, hosted by the Dallas Examiner. I am Molly Bell, publisher of the Dallas Examiner, and we have hosted Monday Night Politics for a little over 10 years. Um, the Dallas Examiner does not endorse candidates. Uh, what we try to do is to give our community information so that when they go to vote, they are informed voters. We're very fortunate tonight to have as our moderator, Demetria McCain. She's moderated for us several times before. Demetria is a Dallasite and active uh, community member. Demetria. Well, hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much, Molly. 
It is really good to be back with you all with uh, after a little hiatus from Monday Night Politics from myself. So I'm glad you're here. Tell your friends and family members about future Monday Night Politics. Um, just remember that the race that we're talking about today uh, takes place, the actual voter voting day, election day, will be July 14th. A lot of people don't know that. July 14th is the day of the election. We have a particular format that is known to regular Monday Night Politics followers, and that includes a two-minute opening statement from the candidate. And I will tell you right now that uh, the Dallas Examiner got word that Ms. Uh, Ms. Hagar will not be present today, but we are joined by State Senator Royce West, who will be here to answer your questions. So we'll start with two-minute opening. We'll finish with a two-minute closing. And in between, there'll be a one minute response to your question. Now, you may be asking, how do I ask a question? Your questions that will be read from the Q&A box. And to the extent that I can, I will try not to repeat questions and we'll try to consolidate some of those. So for our time together, I will get to as many as possible. But please, if you could, make it a question and not a comment. That would be great. Um, at this time, I do want to introduce our timekeeper. You know her from previous Monday Night Politics. That's Christy Thomas. Christy will be here, um, and she will give a 30-second warning. <laughs> Sounds like that. Thank you, Christy. And then she'll give a time's up sound. Which will sound like a time's up sound. <laughs> So, um, so what we'll do again, I'm going to start out with a couple of questions, just two, I promise just two for me, and then I'll turn it over to you, the audience. So please start thinking about your questions and put that in the Q&A box. Um, so right now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce for you um, State Senator Royce West. Again, Ms. Hagar informed the Dallas Examiner that she would not be present. Welcome, Senator West. Major, thank you very much. She said she would not be present. That's correct. That's the word that Dallas Examiner got. So you are on the spot. No, you know, I'm at home. And, and thank you very much, Molly Bell, for all the things that the Dallas Examiner continues to do in this community. And thank every one of you that have come out this evening to be a part of Monday Night Politics, an institution in this community. When you begin to think about where we are in this state, you know that based on electing me as your state senator these, these many years that I deliver, that I work, that I'm in the community. And yes, that as your United States Senator, I also will deliver. You think about criminal justice, which is reform, which is probably at the top of the issues that we need to tackle in this country. Uh, Royce West has been there. I've led the charge in certain initiatives across the state. You as well as I know that if we did not have body cameras, that many of the things that here too before that kind of kind of went uncovered, you know, in the dark of the night, we now are beginning to see more and more of exactly what goes on in many instances of uh, uh, transactions and interactions between law enforcement and citizens. Dash cameras, Royce West, hate crimes. Royce West working with other legislators taking a leadership role in order to get that done. Racial profiling. Royce West, get it done in terms of those issues. Community Safety Education Act, which I've explained to you in several different occasions, but I don't want to go into too much detail about it. The fact is, is that we now have in our driver's license manual and our police academy what the behavioral expectations are of citizens and police doing traffic interactions, as well as what your rights are. Think about COVID. The state senate office has been very involved in making certain we provided information and dealt with issues that were important each and every one of you. And so from that vantage point, from COVID to women's issues, to climate change, to civil rights, to voting rights, as, as it relates to also the work to human rights, Lois West has been there. I will be there for you as your United States Senator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, those with the opening remarks from our state Senator Royce West, Ms. Hagar informed us that she would not be present um, with us today, but we're going to move on to questions, and I have a, I have a couple here that I'll use, I'll start with, and then I'll go to the Q and A box for the public's questions. So you did make reference, obviously, 
to policing. Recently on Lone Star Politics, Grummer Jeffers highlighted statistics about the disproportionate number of Blacks dying at the hands of peace officers, particularly in the state of Texas. If elected as U.S. Senator, how would you address the issue, A, if your party takes control of the Senate and White House, and how would you address it, B, if your party does not take control of the Senate or the White House? A very good question. Thank you for the uh, question. In terms of taking, if the party takes the White House as well as the Senate, then the different legislative initiatives that are going through right now would probably end up passing. I would also add to that, I'd want to have one law across this entire country in terms of when police officers could use deadly force. I'd use the budgetary uh, bully pulpit in order to make certain states pass that law. I'd want to make certain also that we have a situation where um, the policies of police departments concerning deadly force were put into place. If for some reason we lose the, uh, if we don't, I shouldn't say lose, if we don't get the majority in the Senate, yes, I've got to be able to work across party lines, count the votes, make certain I can get done whatever I can get done. I would still push those particular issues and I would appeal to those Republicans that know better in terms of what we should have, not several different laws concerning the use of deadly force, but making sure we have one standard law across this country. So I do that and also deal with issues concerning and also issues concerning and so Thank you. Okay, next question. In the recent New York Times opinion article entitled The End of Black Politics, Kenyanka Yamata Taylor wrote, and I'll quote, we're tumbling toward generational and class conflict. Close quote. What can you say to those 35 years and younger who have lost faith in the political process's ability to represent the needs of low-income black and brown people? I would, say, I would say to you that this represents a great opportunity to kind of re-engage you into what's going on. We now have a coalition of people that recognize that things need to change in this country. You know, I think uh, Al Sharpton put it best. America has never been great as it relates to African-Americans, Latinos, and poor people. We get the opportunity now to make America great by voting. That's the tool that we have. There's no sense in there saying that we can go out and burn and pillage. That's not going to work at all. We've got to make certain that we turn back to voting in record numbers as we have in the past when Barack Obama ran for president and make certain that we engage you in this process, make certain that you become a part of the, of the, of the, of the chain of new leaders that are coming forward. We, you've got to be a part of that pipeline. And for one, I'll make certain as your United States Senator that you're a part of the pipeline for leadership in the state of Texas. Thank you. And now we'll turn to our audience questions. So audience, go right ahead, um, go to your Q&A box. The first question here we have is, Please share your recommendations regarding refunding police agencies. I'm not sure if they meant to put defunding, but it states refunding. So if you can answer. It's probably defunding. Uh, I think that we've got to look at the core missions of police departments. You remember when uh, David Brown was chief of police here in Dallas, and he talked about all the roles that police officers have to play. We have to define what that role needs to be. It needs to be a local conversation which I think our conversation is beginning to happen here in Dallas. And to the extent that it's not a core role, then we need to make certain that those resources that have been allocated to the police department for those particular functions go to quote unquote healthcare providers, uh, go to social workers, whatever we need as it relates to answering calls in the community, we need to make certain that we have persons prepared, police backup, but they're not the dominant person on the, on the scene in order to kind of de-escalate or take care of the problems associated with it. So we have to redefine what the police department's mission is and make certain that that core mission is funded properly and that the persons there are recruited and that we do an evaluation to make certain that they're the, per the appropriate persons to do that particular type of work. Okay, thank you. We do have um, a question here from Marvin Earl. Uh, the question is, uh, about bail bond reform in Houston 
and why Dallas County has not changed their oppressive fees. So uh, we've got somewhat of a county question here. Um, if you could touch on the issue of bail bond reform, that may be helpful. Um, and then, and perhaps uh, while you're at it, if you can lay out the distinctions between the impact of being a federally elected uh, officer versus a county level, that would be educational, I think, for our audience. Okay, uh, two things. Uh, Marvin, I think that we need to have bail bond reform here in Dallas County. Houston has taken the leadership on this particular issue. I think Dallas needs to figure out exactly what it's going to do. Obviously, it's a county level um, issue. And when you begin to think about the different levels of government, for those that are, are not that familiar with it, you obviously have the federal, the state, the county, city council, and of course, you have school districts. And we've got to all be able to work together. But the question then becomes, who takes the lead on certain types of situations? In this situation, county government takes the lead on bail bond reform, not the federal government. Okay, another question from the same um, person is regarding healthcare inequities. Uh, very, there are very many people who are uninsured. Um, there are boarded up hospitals across the street from Keys Park. In your district, there's uh, lupus, sickle cell, diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. So the issue is uh, addressing healthcare inequities. Well, uh, you, you're right. We, need, we, we do need to address uh, healthcare inequities. And yes, we do have hospitals that are boarded up, and there have been several attempts in order to open up those that hospital, as you recall, Marvin. And what's happening now is, is that we have Redbird Mall being reengaged, reimagined, and one of the Part of that reimagination is Southwest, uh, UG Southwestern, making certain that it provides health care in, in that particular area. And so that's not the only area that needs to be provided in the southern sector of Dallas, but it will pro provide the opportunity for persons to be able to be seen by health care providers that hadn't existed before. We need to do the same thing in Southeast Dallas County to, do, uh, to make certain that Parkland and other health care facilities begin to look at that area to provide equal access to healthcare. Thank you. Um, and this question is uh, one near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think it, it, it uh, can be impacted by all levels of government. It's regarding Shingle Mountain. What efforts, w I guess, would you, if elected, could be made to eliminate Shingle Mountain? And I'll go further and say Shingle Mountain's plural in case they happen other places. Obviously there's several levels of government. If folks on the call don't know, Shingle Mountain is the 12 story high pile of recycled shingles that were permitted to be dumped in a residential area not very far from Paul Quinn College. Um, there's been lots of activity from um, Southern Sector Rising, Neighbors United, um, and Ms. Jackson who actually lives there to get rid of Shingle Mountain, but it has not uh, disappeared just yet. So do you have anything to say about that, Senator Webb? Well, what I had to say about it is, is once I became aware of it, I worked with Councilman Atkins to make certain that we pulled in uh, the appropriate state agency that's responsible for it. The last time I checked, and it's been a few minutes ago, that was still tied up in litigation in order to get it removed. I'll continue to work with uh, Councilman Atkins and others in order to make certain we get rid of that ISO in our community. And last question from this caller. Um, uh, wanting to know a little bit about the issue of reducing redlining in your district and what role redlining plays in the wealth gap um, as, and, and what role it plays regarding reducing high crime numbers. So the impact of redlining to the extent it still exists today or remnants of it still exist today and that how that impacts the wealth gap and high crime. Well, it, it does impact the wealth gap. And what I will say to you, Ms. Carr, is this, is that we as African Americans in this community now have more power than we've ever had. I've said it over again, and I'll say it, I've said it before and I'll say it over again. We, we need to utilize our power in order to make certain that the redlining that's going on, specifically with banks and other financial institutions, yes, they, they may very well um, say the right words, but the question is, what are they doing? We need to make certain that from our city government, our county government, and to the extent we have the authority, through our state and federal government, that we take them to task and make certain that when we believe redlining is going on, we call them to the table and we make certain we show them where the redlining is going on and get a plan from them that they will respond to it. 
And to the extent that they don't respond, then we've got to look at whether or not they need, they're good citizens. And from that vantage point, um, if they're not good citizens, what do we need to do in order to correct their behavior? Thank you. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on the issue of judicial nominations as it relates to the role of the, role of the U.S. Senate. Um, many people have been unhappy with uh, the federal judicial nominations and for our audience, those who uh, get appointed as to the federal judiciary have pretty much lifetime appointments. Um, could you speak to that issue, please, Senator? Yes, again, elections matter, my friends. You know, I think that, I think I'm quoting Trump, Trump right, and I don't know whether or not it's accurate or not. He's probably um, been able to get about 250 judges through the Senate through the confirmation process. And the reason is, is because Republicans control the Senate. Bottom line, they can, and they control the presidency. Bless Ruth Bader Ginsburg's heart. She's hanging in there. And we've got to make certain that her staying in the position as a, as a justice on the Supreme Court is not lost. We've got to make certain that we win the election in November in order to make certain we get a Democrat on the Supreme Court that's you know neutral, but yet and still have common sense. Now I'm, I'm I am hardened by the fact that last week we had two pretty uh, unusual, at least I didn't think it would happen, uh, uh, decisions. One dealing with uh, with DACA, and uh, the other one dealing with uh, the LGBTQ community, which I thought well, were good decisions by the court. So I'm kind of hardened from the standpoint that just because Trump nominated and put a couple of justices in place, that they're not going to be, uh, frankly, dealing with uh, the, just doing the, the, the Trump business on the U.S. Supreme Court as opposed to doing the people business. All right, and we have a, a question from a college student here. For college students, how exactly will you be appealing to them, especially since this generation is the next coming into changing politics? You've got to remember, Demetria, that over the course of the years I've been the state senator, I've had an internship program, okay? And so I appeal to them uh, through my internship program and other programs that we've had. Over the course of the past 27 years, my friend, we've had over 3,000 internship opportunities for young people in the senatorial district. Some of those are now members of uh, elected bodies, appointed bodies, uh, heading up uh, the, the school district as an example. Uh, Mr. Chairman used to be an intern for me on my higher education committee in the Texas legislature. Uh, Harrison Blair, who's now over the Black Chamber of Commerce, he used to be an intern in my office. Uh, Dominique Torres used to be a, a, a part of our internship program. I can go on and on. Uh, uh, Keisha, Ke uh, I'm messing up now. Keisha Langford I'm on the um, school board and Cedar Hill was in my internship program. I can go on and on in terms of the opportunities we've provided young students and we continue, we continue to do that. It's important, let me finish this, it's important to build a line. We've got to make sure we have a line that will allow students to kind of go through that pipeline and become future leaders. And I, I continue to do that and I've demonstrated I have done. On the issue of, of housing, particularly fair housing, the current um, Ben Carson HUD um, and the administration has been attempting through regulation to dismantle some of the gains that were made during the Obama administration. Um, could you speak to this issue of, of dismantling previous gains that had been made from a regulatory point of view, not necessarily legislation, because clearly the Fair Housing Act has existed since 1968 and nobody has repealed it. Well, and this is where, this is where again, electing Joe Biden as your president and Royce West as your United States Senator comes into play. The secretaries of these various agencies, housing, education, all are doing the bidding of Donald Trump. Don't be confused. They're doing his bidding. And once Joe Biden becomes president, Carson will be out of there. And some of the regulations that they put in place will be able to repeal them and to the extent that Congress needs to make certain that in the future that those types of regulations can't be considered 
by the agency or agencies, then we can look at trying to put in place a law that would then require uh, the Congress to be able to repeal that law, which is very difficult. And so again, making certain we have a president that's sensitive to housing issues, which would be Biden, making certain Biden nominates the, nominates the right person, the right person to the Senate for confirmation. Thank you. Um, HBCUs. I know there was a fight to try to make sure HBCUs were included in the COVID funding. Can you speak about the issue of HBCUs from a federal funding point of view? Well, I'll, I'll speak to them based on my experiences with them. You asked the presidents of the historically black colleges in Dallas, Jack, Mike Sorrell. Sorrell, who's been right there with him in terms of funding? He'll tell you that Royce West has been there, as, as well as the other HB, private HBCUs and the public HBCUs. Ask those presidents, and I'll tell you that I've been there with them. It's going to be real important that as we get a new president in, that I sit back down with the HBCUs and figure out exactly what we need to do. You know, when you think about reparations, uh, I think that part of reparations need to make certain that our historical black colleges have the resources that they need in order to educate our children so they can be future business persons and leaders. That ought to be a part of the reparations package that we're taking into consideration. So you know where I am, you know what I've done, you know that I'll be pushing for funding, appropriate funding for them. You look at uh, Tom Joyner Foundation. We raised over $65 million for historically black colleges. Uh, the time. I'll continue to work on those things. Okay, we have a question here from Courtesy McCowan. There appears to be an ongoing attempt for some states like Texas to limit local control by cities. Do you foresee any opportunity for the federal for federal legislation to limit states from placing certain restrictions on municipalities? Um, Chris, Madam Mayor, no, I do not. I don't think that Congress has that power. Uh, that has to be done at the state level. That's why it's real important that we take the House of Representatives here in Texas and, and gain additional state Senate seats in 2020. And then look towards the victories that we have in 2020 will help us in terms of having a blueprint for 2022. And until we get that type of power back, Madam Mayor, you're still going to have an uh, onslaught of legislation trying to limit the power of local governmental entities. Thank you. Um, so this is maybe a loaded question, but um, do you see yourself um, uh, wanting to be appointed to any particular committees if elected? Do you have oh, any yeah. um, yes. priorities? I want to be on. I want to be on finance budget. I want to be there. I want to be on education, labor, and pensions. There you are. I suppose you did have an opinion on that. One. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. You got to, <laughs> got to kind of know where you want to go in order to get there. All right. Question here from Catherine McGovern: Do you agree that HBCUs should be transparent concerning salary and benefit structures of its officials? administrators and staff absolutely all institutions if you're getting federal money you've got to be transparent people uh, taxpayers have a right to know where their tax dollars are, are going and how they're being spent yes i do Kathy. All right looks like we've done all of those in the queue um i'll give the we've got 70 participants here i guess they're a little shy um wow. that i've one that i've got an email to me is um, how exactly can you appeal to older voters who don't vote? So not necessarily the young people, but people who simply don't vote. How do you appeal to them? Well, you know, I've never had that question asked before. I think it's real important to remind them that there were people that came before us that kind of laid down their lives to give us the right to vote and that uh, we, we had a lot of gains, maybe not as many as we wanted, but we had a lot of gains by making certain that we voted. Uh, I'd remind them that Barack Obama would not have been the first African-American president or the second African-American president if we didn't vote. 
And in order to make certain that we deal with some of the issues at hand, it's real important that they exercise their right to vote. We've made it very convenient by them being able to get an application and then getting their ballot at home in order to cast their vote. And so I would, I would, uh, I would uh, plead with them to not take this privilege that we fought for, that we died for, lightly and exercise their right to vote. Kappa touched on um, the federal government's um, strength as, as actually holding the purse strings as it relates to public education. Do you have any positions as it relates to public education? Clearly, Betsy DeVos is head right now of uh, education for the federal government, but do you have any opinions as it relates to public education and the role the federal government can play? Well, I think that uh, we've got to get we've got to get control of the secretary the uh, the Department of Education again. That's why it's so important to Joe Biden get elected. I am a pro-public school state senator. I'll be a pro-public school U.S. senator. That's exactly where I'm going to be. And the fact is, is that you know the first battle was was with vouchers, and I stood up against those vouchers. The fact is, is that to the extent that the public school system did not meet the uh, the, the issues associated with the low performance schools. I didn't have a problem with charter schools, but I did. I do have a char problem with charter schools as they now attempt, attempt to, um, re frankly, recreate what's being done in a lot of public schools that are doing fairly well from an account accountability standpoint. And we begin to talk about the monies associated with education. We know we don't have uh, just a giant well. We've got to make it more efficient with the use of those particular dollars. And from that standpoint, we've got to make certain that our public private school, our public uh, community, our neighborhood public schools get the funding necessary in order to be efficient and effective with the students in those particular areas. What is your stance on universal health care and or restoring some key provisions of Obamacare? I believe that every person in this country should have quality health care. I think that we need, we take Obamacare, we take a look at what the issues are associated with it, and we fix those issues. And you, as well as I know, that um, there is a lawsuit that's making its way through the federal court system. John Corning has voted 20 times, my friends, 20 times to repeal Obamacare. And so we've got to make certain that whatever those issues are, that we fix those issues. I do not have a problem. If a person wants to keep their insurance, they should be able to do that. And in terms of prescription drugs, right now, we have a situation where prescription drugs, specifically brand drugs, according to AARP, are sick on an average of $6,000 a year. We can do better. We've got to make certain that we use the awesome uh, collective judgment in a group in terms of the federal government in order to better negotiate prices with drug manufacturers. We can do that. And there's several other, other um, changes that we can make concerning it. And also making certain that money should be invested in pharmaceuticals and return to taxpayers. Thank you. Next question is uh, related to DACA. How would you address DACA, meaning the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals? Well, we need to make certain that, again, that was one of the decisions that was handed down. We need to make certain we provide a pathway to citizenship. These kids have been in this country all their life. Yes, they came over uh, with parents, but they've been in this country all their life. And yes, they need to. We need to make sure we provide a pathway to citizenship. The fact of the matter is, is uh, I have had a couple of DACA students working in, in what, volunteering in my state senate office to help find ways that we could deal with this DACA issue. I'll continue to work to make certain that there is a pathway to citizenship. Okay. Um, there is an appreciation for your support of early education and quality childcare in Texas. How can you strengthen this support in Washington beyond ex the exclusive Head Start funding? Well, it gets, again, it gets down to the persons who are the secretaries of the agencies that, are, uh, that handle or are responsible for those issues. And it gets down to budgetary concerns also. And so I would make certain that whomever comes through the Senate for confirmation 
understand what my position is on that. It's real clear to me that when you begin to look at early childhood development, that, is, it's, that the resources need to be there and we've got to have the experts there in order to help those kids get through the process. I'll tell you this, um, when George Bush was governor of the state of Texas, he, he would say that if a child can't read by the third grade, he, that person could not be uh, promoted. And I said over my dead body, okay? But then when I began to look at the data, if a child can't read by the third grade, then that child is gonna be pretty much doomed if they don't get the right educators going through that particular process. So we've got to make certain that an early child is well funded and appropriate for the need. All right, the next two questions um, uh, relate to voting. I'm gonna ask them together and you can ask, answer them as you please. And um, uh, Christy Thomas, please give us two minutes for this one since they're two together. First part, there seems to be some confusion about Texans' ability to vote by mail. Please describe where you stand. The second part is there's a current push for vote by mail. Are you in support of national vote by mail? So both related to voting by mail. Uh, Dimitri, I didn't understand the second question. Uh, are you in support of the national vote by mail law that some people are pushing? Okay. This one thing to me. The fact of that is, yes, I'm in favor of vote by mail. It is ridiculous, my friends, to be quote unquote America. And we're trying to make it difficult for people to vote. We can make it as convenient as possible. You know, uh, Republicans sit up and say there's a bunch of uh, fraud and abuse. No, it's not. There are no real related cases concerning fraud and abuse as it relates to mail-in ballots. We've been, you, the military has always used this particular process. We've never heard any complaints about the military. So if the military can do it, surely citizens should be able to do it around this country, in the state, and also around this country. So it doesn't take me two minutes to answer that question. That's how I feel about it. All right, great. Um, with no more questions in the queue, we'll move on to your two-minute closing statement. Go right ahead. My friends, you know me. This is home for me. You know the work that I've done as a state senator from creating internship programs to developing pipelines where students get an opportunity to become elected officials, to building universities, law schools, supporting HBCUs, both public and private, being a, a champion for education, public education, making certain that teachers get pay raises, dealing with issues concerning criminal justice, and being on the front line in terms of some of the bills that I've passed that have helped in terms of transparency, accountability, as it relates to police departments. And you know I'll do the same. When you begin to look at issues concerning climate change, which many of you may not even be aware that I've been involved in climate change issues. If you go up to West Texas and see those windmill farms, Royce West was involved in making that a reality. There have been those that have attempted to try to drive away incentives for solar energy. Royce West has been right at the forefront of making certain that we have solar energy and clean energy, wind energy. And I guess I believe that by the year 2050, we need to seriously have zero net, zero net gas house emissions. And so, we have an opportunity, my friends, to make sure we deal with women-related issues, civil rights, voting rights, all of those issues. And so the question becomes, do we want to be a, a victim of history, or do we want to make history? I'm ready. I've done the work that's necessary. Now I need your support. I need your support by volunteering. I need your support by contributing to the campaign, whatever you can. Go to Royce, R-O-Y-C-E, West, Dot com. Make certain that you go there, get the content from my website, and make certain that you share it with others on social media and ask them to do the same. We will no longer be a victim of history. We will make history together by electing Royce West as your next United States Senator. Thank you very much. All right. Much. Thank you very much. It has been uh, a good conversation. Hopefully, folks have learned something or 
has, they have been energized, um, but we do appreciate you being here with us today. And we hope that you tell others about future Monday Night Politics because there are many other races taking place in 2020. And um, I just wanna take this time to thank uh, some of our co-sponsors here. Um, so thank you very much, Senator West, for being with us here today. Demetri, can I say one other thing? Yes, go right ahead. I just wanna make sure you understand that Royce West was present. Noted. Okay, noted. all right. That is noted, thank you, Senator. And here are some of our co-sponsors. Um, I will list them, they are on your screen, but I would list them for you. Uh, some of the co-sponsors of Monday Night Politics include the ACP uh, chapter, uh, the Dallas chapter, I should say, um, the Dallas alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Metropolitan Dallas chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, Alpha Sigma Lambda chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha, and the Dallas Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi, Dallas Association of Realists, the Dallas Panhellenic Council, Theta Alpha Chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Delta Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, Omicron Mu Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Dallas League of Young Professionals, the North Texas Cluster of the Links Incorporated, KHVN, the Commish Radio Show, St. Luke P. Sam, Political and Social Action Ministry, and the African American Museum. Thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you soon in the fall. In the meantime, make sure your friends are registered. Take care.